All right, y'all. Look, Pastor Blake did not update y'all this morning. I updated y'all last week about these noonday nuggets. It's 1157. I'm coming in, trying to come in early. I got good guys in here around me, uh, like Daryl Jackson and uh, Joe Chin. They're going to start letting people know, man, here we go. Man, we're going to start sharing this thing, noonday nuggets. Let's roll. Let's roll. Come on in. Y'all got y'all got three minutes to come in. So, look here. Came out early. I think I think Joe Chin is on. I think Daryl Jackson's on. Man, it's time to go. Mark chapter one, verse twenty nine through forty five. Mark chapter one, verse twenty nine through forty five. Let's let the people know. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get officially started till till noon, so give y'all a chance to dive in. Got my son shooting 200 jumpers right now. James Bell in the house. Bell, please share, man. Let the folk know that we 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 back, man. We're trying to get in this thing. Let the people know, y'all. Let the people know. We had the Crossover Bible Fellowship at the house today, doing a little work. We got good men in here. Come on, come on. Let's do. Let's let the brothers know. Start putting some names in here. Start telling folk, come on in here. John McGee. Let me see. How do we get John McGee in here? Let's go. Start telling some folk. All right, Sister Gonzalez, I see you coming in. Let's see who else we're going to put in here. Um... Mike Ward, I see you, Mike. You coming in faithful. Coming in faithful, Mike. I see you. Thank y'all for remembering. Y'all let some folk know, man. We ain't been in here in a while. There she goes, Sister Sap. I see you. Here come the faithful. Here come the faithful. All right, Crystal Solomon, I see you in the house. Here come my people. Let's go get it, family. Let's go get it. All right, all right. We got one minute before we get going. Come on, y'all start putting some, some, some names in here so folk can come in. They forgot all about the pastor, amen? They forgot about me. Mm-hmm. All right, well, y'all, <clears throat> it's 12 noon. Good to be back for Noonday Nuggets. And uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, verse 29 through 45, Mark chapter 1, verse 29 through 45. Y'all let some people know, put some names in there, some people that y'all are used to seeing. Yeah, yeah, bring them in, bring them in. Uh, Joaquin, uh, put old Joaquin, hey, hey, Joe, put Joaquin in there. Let Joaquin know that we in the house. Amen. Sister Had Not, all right, I see you. I see you. We told you we'd be back, and so we're trying to be back and get in this Mark chapter 1. It's 12 noon. It's now 12.01, so I'm going to start praying for us, and we're going to get into the Word of God. Mark chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 29 through 45. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come back, Lord, and uh, we're thankful to get an opportunity to see your son Jesus Christ today through the Word of God on some noonday nuggets. God, I ask that you would speak to us, God, and speak through us. Lord, as we've been traveling uh, through Mark chapter 1, Father God, and then had a hiccup there for about a week and a half, God. We ask that you come back and be with us, God. Remind us and refresh us what it looks like to see Jesus in everyday life. And so I pray, Father, that you would um, speak to us, grow us, Lord, that we'd be faithful to um, what it is that you've called us to do, uh, God, that we'd be um, excited each and every day to come into your presence together as family and friends and get into this thing. And so, God, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. 
Let's roll, family. Mark chapter 1, verse 29 through 45. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. Immediately they spoke to Jesus about her, and he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and fever left her, uh, left her, and she, wait, and she waited on him. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and all of those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases uh, and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went away to, seclude, to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions search for him and they found him and said to him everyone is looking for you and he said to them let us go somewhere else to the nearby towns so that i may preach there also uh for that is what i have come for and he went into the into their synagogues throughout all galilee preaching and casting out demons and a leper came to jesus beseeching him falling on his knees before him and saying if you are willing you can make me clean move with compassion jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him, and immediately sent him away. He said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer it for yourself cleansing that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely to the spread and, uh, and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in the unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from everywhere. Mark chapter one, verse uh, 29 through 45. As we dive into uh, what it looks like to see Jesus on a daily basis, uh, we see that Jesus has transitioned. Um, he was at the synagogue the last time we were together. And he was preaching the gospel in the synagogue, the, the, the gospel of the kingdom. And when he preached the gospel of the kingdom, we realized that there was a man that, there, that was there who was demon-possessed. As he preached, they not only said that he preached with authority, but he exercised power, and he cast the demon out of him. And they, they realized that there was something different about what Jesus was doing, and not only about something that Jesus was doing, that he was somebody different. He was somebody unique. And so they saw Jesus um, in power. They saw Jesus in preaching. And they saw him performing the word of God. So as a result, we now transition when the sermon is over, you know that the preacher has to go eat. And so when the preacher goes to eat, we find Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 29 through 45. And we first find him in the first scene in Simon Peter's house. And in verse 29, it says, And immediately they came out of the synagogue, and they came into the house of Simon and Andrew uh, with James and John. Now, Simon and Andrew are brothers. Uh, they were the ones that Jesus calls out of the boat to come and follow him. And James and John also come. But they go to Simon's house, and Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. And immediately they, they, spoke about, uh, they spoke to Jesus about her. Now, the interesting thing is that they mentioned that Simon's mother has a fever. If you were to go back into Deuteronomy chapter 8, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 28, you would realize that the children of Israel would not have fevers nor diseases if they had been obeying uh, God. And if they were obeying God and obeying his words, that God would bless them. And so as a result, when you see that Peter's mother has a fever and you start seeing all these people, as you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll start seeing all these people are sick. They got a fever. They have this disease. They have this demon. They have uh, this, different things going on with them. And it is a sign that when Jesus came on the scene, that the nation of Israel and people of Israel individually were living in disobedience to God. And so when Jesus comes, he begins to cast out these demons, cast out these sicknesses, because the people of God were not supposed to be sick if they obeyed him, according to Deuteronomy 28. But if they disobeyed him, they would get things like this. So when the Bible points out that she has a fever, it is pointing out that, you know, Simon's mother uh, individually somewhere in her life is living in a state of disobedience. But at the exact same time, the nation of Israel is also under national disobedience. Um, we see in the Old Testament that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego or Hananiah, Meshach and Azariah, 
they're living in individual obedience while the nation is living in disobedience. And so they begin to obey God. So although the nation can be undergoing the curse of God, individually you can remove the curse by living obediently to God. So there's something going on with Peter's mom and she's sick. And as Jesus goes there, they talk to her about being sick. And the Bible says that Jesus, um, uh, she's lying there sick. And immediately they spoke to Jesus about her, verse 30. And he came to her and he raised her up, taking her by the hand. And the fever left her and she waited on them. That her healing was so complete by Jesus that she has no lingering effects. That when Jesus touches the sick and heals the sick, that there was no lingering effects in her. And she immediately got out of a place to needing to be served to be to be a position of serving now remember in mark 10 verse 45 the theme of the book of mark is that jesus did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom away for many so when people of god get healed by god you see an innate ability and desire to serve others and so that's what peter's mom is doing as you see that she begins to wait on them now when evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and to those who were demon-possessed. Now, notice that they're bringing to Jesus all these people who are ill. Um, as they're bringing people who are ill, there are really two factors that come behind this. Number one, he's been in the public synagogue and he cast the demon out. So while in the public synagogue, he cast the demon out. And now in a private home, he goes and heals, heals uh, Peter's mother. They found out where Jesus Christ is. And his reputation for healing starts bringing people to Jesus. Why? Because we need to be healed. And we recognize that this man has something different that the Pharisees uh, don't offer. This man has something different that the scribes don't offer. He has the ability not only to preach, but to perform with power and to bring about healing. A lot, oftentimes when we talk about the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 53, and it talks about how he healed us of our diseases and our sicknesses, people will say, oh, because Jesus Christ um, you know, uh, came, he's healing us of all physical diseases. Now he can heal us of all physical diseases. That's fact. But at the exact same time, he's also healing us of the spiritual diseases of our sin and our soul. But here you see, he's able to do both physically heal and also spiritually heal. And so they bring to him people who were ill and those who were demon possessed. Verse 33, and the whole city gathered at the door. So now the popularity of Jesus based on what he's doing, the reputation of service, the reputation of helping, the reputation of delivering those from evil and sickness is spreading. Jesus is, is doing work and that work that he's doing is now causing people to say, hey, he's able to heal. Let me drop in a dime right here for churches. Uh, when people bring their family members to the house of God, they're expecting God's presence and power to be there so that God can do something inside their families. Um, th this is interesting because I'm early and I'm going to, I'm, I'm diving all the way over to Mark chapter nine. In Mark one, the people are bringing people to Jesus because Jesus is successfully healing. In Mark chapter nine, after disciples have successfully healed in chapter six, find themselves with one demon possessed boy that they're unable to heal. And the man said, I brought them to you, so to, to your disciples so they could heal them. And Jesus was uh, disappointed that his disciples were not able to heal after he'd already given them the ability to heal. And it was because they were not spending time in prayer. Notice what Jesus does after he heals. In Mark chapter one, uh, it says this, it says the whole city gathered and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast uh, out many demons and he was not permitting the demons to speak because he did not want them to know who he was. Jesus was not trying to get the witness of the demonic realm. He wanted the witness of his words and his works to be powerful testimony for them to accept him as Messiah and, and servant king. Now, the text says in verse 35, in the early morning while it was still dark, dark he got up and he left and he went to a secluded place and he was praying. So here, here's the big deal. When power is released from those in the body of Christ, You've got to fill back up in private prayer. You've got to get back to secluded place and pray. Jesus lays out a pattern. I'm going to preach. I'm going to exercise power and perform, but then I'm going to pray. Three Ps. I'm going to preach. I'm going to perform, and then I'm going to go back and pray. I'm going to fill my cup. Jesus did not run on empty. Many of us in ministry can accidentally run on empty, but the issue is that we're running. 
we're, we're doing something, but we're not being with somebody. And so one of the most dangerous things to happen to us in ministry is that we're doing something, but we don't take time privately to get away and to pray and to get with God and to get refilled. And so uh, at some point, you've got to find that personal private place to where you and God commune, that time to take meditation with God, Psalm 1, to meditate on his word day and night, to allow him to speak to you even after having had the opportunity to preach and or to do something for God, you got to get back in a place to where you are being filled back up by God because there are more opportunities, there's more problems, there are more people out there that we've got to serve. In order for us to serve those people well, we've got to be people of prayer. There's got to be a place to where we go privately to get with God and say, okay, Lord, uh, I know that there are people out there. I know that there are problems out there. I know that there are people that are hurting out there. And in order for me to solve those problems, in order for me to help, I've got to privately get in, uh, infused with your power to go back on, uh, and, and fight the battle again. So verse 35, in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went away to a secluded place to pray. And he was praying. So let's talk on this prayer for just one second. Um, there's not a special place that you have to pray. Um, the, you have to get in your zone and you can be riding in the car to work. And that might be the place to where all the kids have been taken to school or e either your mind can be settled. Uh, you can do it in the bed. You can do it while you're cooking breakfast or whatever you're doing, but you got to get in that place privately to get with God to where you hear from him clearly. And you got to get into a place to where there's not all these distractions. Notice he's in a secluded place, a place to where it can just be he and God individually. And prayer is going to build up the body of Christ uh, to perform the works that God has called us to do. And so uh, Simon and his companion searched for him. They found him and they said to him, everyone's looking for you. Now notice this, verse 37 it says, everyone's looking for you. What Simon brings up to Jesus is, Jesus, look at what just happened. You came to my house uh, the day before, and, and man, you healed my mother. You healed all those people. And before that, you were preaching, and now everybody's looking for you. The, the, he thinks that Jesus wants a big crowd. Jesus has already interacted with a crowd. Now it's time for him to interact with his father. So here's a big nugget is that there are going to be, going to be public times of performance, but there needs to be private times of prayer. There are going to be public times of performance, but there's got to be private times of prayer. Jesus is not waving and saying, oh man, you're looking for me? He's not looking for a popularity contest. That's not what he's doing. He's out there serving, but he knows I've got to go back and set a pattern for other believers to know that we preach, we pray, uh, we perform, we pray, we preach, we perform, we do all that, but prayer's got to be mixed in to what we do. Uh, so like normally at Crossover, we have our prayer meetings on the first uh, Wednesday of the month. Uh, although we have what we call a tremendous Bible study, the Emmaus experience, we take time out to set out that first week as time for prayer. And here's the thing, that people will think that Bible study is more important than prayer. Bible study is important. Uh, it, it, it'll always be important. It's the Word of God going forward. But also, it's not just us studying the Word of God and learning from God, but it's also us communing with Him in an individual relationship. Um, so he says this, and Simon and his, uh, and his companion search for him and say, everyone's looking for you. And here's what he says. He said to them, let us go somewhere else to, uh, to towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. I did not come to just be in one place. He came to give us a pattern of going. He came to give us a pattern of searching out others who needed the word of God. Uh, needs have been met here. I'll come back here. But at the exact, exact same time, there are opportunities everywhere. One of the nuggets that we need to recognize and realize is that there's work that we do at the church. There's work that we do inside of our homes. But then there's also works that we do in the community. So where are we needed? And, and, and sometimes we're not needed in all these big places. We're just needed in the next place God has designed us to go. There's always an opportunity that God provides for us to do some ministry. And so uh, he says, everyone's looking for you. He said, let's go to another place so that I can preach there. For, that's, what, that's the reason that I came. Verse 39. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. And notice this. He's already cast out demons in this city, but he goes throughout the cities in Galilee. And now he's preaching again and he's casting out demons. What is he doing? He's praying and he's performing. So why does the Bible keep showing us all these demons that are coming up? As I mentioned earlier, Deuteronomy 28. Uh, when you start seeing all these sicknesses coming up, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, if you do these things, I'll bless you. 
15 through 69, if you do these things, I'm going to curse you. And including them being under sicknesses and diseases that they weren't designed to get if they would originally obey. And so verse 40 says, and a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, falling on his knees before him and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now notice that Jesus has transitioned and he's moved from one place to another. And as he's moved to this another to this other place, he now comes across a leper. Now, in, in the Old Testament, leprosy uh, and also in the New Testament was one of the worst diseases that you could have. And there was specialized cleansing that a person had to go through in order to be healed. But the thing that you did not do is you did not get close to a leper. It was believed very much like during the season of COVID that a sneeze or just being within 20 feet of a leper and breathing in the same air that you could get leprosy. That if that leper came from the air that you breathed as he walked by, that there was potentiality that you could get leprosy. And this was a horrible disease that no one wanted to get. And so Jesus does something that no one is ever going to do. He's going to touch the leper. Watch this, verse 40. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, and fell on his knees before him, saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Move with compassion. There it is, Jesus, move with compassion. Stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Jesus Christ touches leprosy. He puts his hand on it. This is not the right to healing of leprosy in the Old Testament. But what Jesus is showing you and what Jesus is showing me is that I can touch your worst diseases because I care for you. I can touch your worst situations because I care for you and I love you. That, that, and and I, don't, I don't get infected by it. Matter of fact, I come and disinfect your sin. Um, you, you, you're going to infect me at the cross, but you're not going to infect me right now. Um, I'm going to touch you. I'm going to heal you. I'm willing to touch you. I'm willing to clean you. The dirtiest situation that you could ever be in, Jesus Christ is willing to put his hand in your situation and mine and make sure that we're healed. And so, but notice he's moved with compassion. It's the ability to see a problem and to address a problem. It's the ability to not only say, see and observe and be uh, sympathetic, but it's a, it's a ability to see and put your hand on a situation and involve yourself to solve the problem that's at hand. So as he's moved with compassion, he touches him and he says, I'm willing to be cleansed. Now, immediately the leprosy left him. Now notice that the same way that leprosy uh, leaves him was the same way that Peter's mother was immediately healed. It's the power of Jesus Christ to touch your, your situation and bring about immediate change. As you and I pray and as we long for God, the leper came to Jesus Christ, cried out and fell at his feet. Um, here's one of the things that we're struggling with in the church is that sometimes we're struggling with just the humble cry out, the humble falling on your face before God and saying, God, you are the only one that can heal. You're the only one that can solve. You're the only one that can resolve my problem. And we've gotten too sophisticated for God to cry out like that. But where we need to be is humbly at his feet saying, you're the only one that can touch. You're the only one that can heal. And he has power to immediately address your issue. And so while he can solve an issue over time, Jesus Christ, all you really need to know is from one yes and one touch from Christ can change your entire situation. Regardless of how long your situation has been going on, regardless of how long you've been dealing with it, when Jesus Christ reaches out and touches your situation, everything's changed. And so he says this, and he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Now notice that Jesus Christ is doing a couple of things. He did not want the demons to testify about him, nor does he want this man with leprosy to testify about him right now. He says, see to it that you tell uh, that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Jesus wanted him to do things orderly. While he healed the man, there was also that ritual rite from the Old Testament that I told you about in the process by which the priest would acknowledge that someone was publicly cleaned. So now it was normally about a seven day period that they would make sure that they were acknowledged as cleansed. But there's something that's happened different. Immediately, Jesus touched him. It didn't take this seven day process. So Jesus has touched the man. And so the priest would have been blown away. This would have really been a witness to the priest who would have announced that he was publicly 
uh, healed, but they would not have just announced that this public general healing took place. They will announce that this public specific healing took place and the one who healed him was Jesus Christ. It would have given the priest a chance to believe in Christ. So he's not just uh, saying, don't go tell anybody. He wants the priesthood to know those that the people are listening to, those that are interceding on their behalf that represent uh, God in the temple, in the synagogue. He says, I want them to know. I want what I've done for you privately to be known to them publicly so they can announce to everybody what's done and what's taking place. And so, but watch what the man does. Uh, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out into the unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. So, um, my man got a little excited about getting healed he, to the degree that he didn't even obey what Jesus told him to do. Jesus wanted him to go through the process, the religious process and the ritual process of going announcing his healing. But this man says, no, this is too good to me and I'm going to disobey Jesus. <laughs> He says, but he went out and starts telling everybody. As a result, Jesus Christ is no longer able to enter a city. So you would think that that would hinder his ministry. But the Bible says this right here. Uh, but he stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. So you would think that this would hinder him because if he goes into a city versus a smaller town or to a little village, that, that he could be more effective in the city. The people were willing to leave uh, the city and come to the unpopulated areas that he was at because he was that powerful. And here's he, he, here's the nugget. When God is doing a work through you and or through a ministry, people will get to it. People will make their way to it. It does not matter how big, how small, it doesn't matter where they are. When they see the genuine presence and power of God at work, people will get to that place. Why? Because they're in need of healing. And what we see is, is that people in Mark chapter one knew before he's ever gone to the cross or anything like that, that Jesus Christ is someone different and he's doing things differently. And so as a result, we have to make sure that as we are emulators of the ministry of Christ, and I'm not talking about collective large church, I'm talking us as the individual church, can people come to you? Can people come to me where we are and get healing? Can they come to us um, having been empowered at a Wednesday uh, church service, at a Sunday church service, at a noonday nuggets? Now, can I go out into the world and people come to me and get healing? Uh, are, are, are we prepared vessels to exercise uh, the healing power of God because we're dealing in his presence, we're dealing in his power, and we've been in prayer? And so that when people come our way with their problems, God has given us the ability to solve those problems. And so wherever we are, we need to make ourselves available. It's not in a special place. Notice where he's been. He has been in a synagogue. He's been in a house. Uh, he's been in a private place to, per, uh, to pray. Um, he's been in some other towns. And now he's in secluded places. And everywhere Jesus goes, people are finding him because his presence and his power is there to perform and to preach and to heal. And so the same way, wherever we go, he sets a pattern for us in Mark chapter one. Doesn't matter where you are, uh, are you available and are you ready? Because somebody and some person has a problem around you and God has sent us there to heal. Amen. So that's it for Mark chapter one. Tomorrow we'll be in Mark chapter two, verse one through 12. Uh, but that's it for Mark chapter one. Um, any questions, any any things that you may ask? Let me see if anybody's got anything. I think y'all were quiet today because y'all like, I can't even believe pastor got back. Thank you, Nathan, for putting that Leviticus 14 in there for us. So Nathan Alote put Leviticus 14 in there for us. That's the healing process. Um, are we willing to get the dirty people ready? Amen. Good question. Good statement. Um, there will be public times of performance. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think that um, as we as we dove back in today and we come back in tomorrow, Mark 2, 1 through 12, uh, that what we get a chance to really see is we get a chance to see that God um, is working through us and that as we look at Jesus in Mark chapter one and we are those lights of the world now and that salt in the earth now is that we got to look at that pattern to where Jesus was willing to preach. He was willing to perform. He's willing to pray. He's willing to meet the needs of, and problems of people. 
but he's also going to all different kind of places. And so let's make ourselves available. As you go out today, uh, go out ready and prepared because somebody may need you. Keep your eyes open and keep your heart open uh, to the opportunities that are available to you um, through God working in us and through us. Amen. If you don't have any questions, man, I'm out of here. And we got out of here at 1226, got out of here early. We did it in 26 meetings. I mean, 26 minutes, 26 meetings, uh, 26 minutes. And so we thank you. Uh, glad to be back. Uh, prayerfully, we're in strong for a while. And uh, we're looking forward to being back with you. And so uh, God bless you. This upcoming Sunday, y'all, we have, uh, uh, what is it? Wise reputation in Proverbs, wise reputation. And then not only do we have wise reputation, this Wednesday night, we have the Emmaus experiences back. We have something for crossed over kids in our children's ministry. We have something for region in our uh, uh, team ministry, but we'll be in Acts chapter one. And uh, last, last time we had a great Acts chapter one. Um, and so we'll be back in Acts chapter one. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Um, last time we did Acts chapter 1, and we did 1 through uh, 11, but we only got through about 5, so we'll be doing 12 through like uh, 12 through 26 or something like that. So we'll be, we'll be rolling. So I uh, look forward to uh, getting back with y'all, and uh, much blessings, much love, and uh, we'll see y'all soon. So God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, but we'll also see you tomorrow for Noonday Nuggets, 12 o'clock, Mark 2, 1 through 12. Much love, family. Glad to be back.